Welcome to basics of finite element uh, analysis. In the last class we were discussing uh, the concept of variation and we were had discussed at length the variational operator. So, what we will do in the remaining part of uh, this week is we will use that particular concept in context of uh, different types of formulations and uh, starting today we will be discussing weighted integral and weak formulations. So, we will illustrate what I intend to talk today and then later generalize uh, uh, through an example for starters. So, what we will do is let us look at this differential equation. And uh, this equation is let us say it is valid for the range 0 to L. So, the domain is 0 to L and the boundary conditions which are specified are that u value of u which is the unknown in this equation is equal to some constant u 0 at. So, okay, at x is equal to 0 that all I have already mentioned in the parenthesis and a times the slope or the derivative of u at x equals l is equal to another constant let us say q naught. So, at x is so we have two uh, ends x is equal to 0 we have one boundary condition and another boundary condition exists at x equals l. This first boundary condition where I am specifying u is known as an essential boundary condition. And how do we figure out whether a boundary condition is essential or not? We will discuss this later, but I wanted to introduce this term uh, right now. So, the first boundary condition is essential boundary condition, and the second boundary condition, which relates to a times du over dx, is known as natural boundary condition. Okay. Couple of other things a of x is known, it is a function of uh, x. Similarly, q of x is known, u naught is known which is relates to this boundary condition, q naught is also known and l which is the value of x all these are known things. So, all these are referred as data of the problem. whatever we know about the problem that is referred as data of the problem. And then of course, x is the independent variable and u of x is the dependent variable. And our aim is find u of x. Okay. And uh, finally, 0 to L is domain of the problem. So, that is the domain of the problem. Now, before we discuss how to solve this problem, I wanted to uh, explain the physical uh, meaning of some of these parameters meaning of a meaning of q u naught q naught and l. And it just turns out that this particular differential equation is valid for a very large number of problems. 
So, we will look at what types of problems this particular differential equation is valid for. So, I will just rewrite the differential equation. So, the first area where this uh, is valid is uh, cable. Okay. Cable. So, if I have a rope or a cable, this uh, tells us that how the what the shape of the cable is going to be, which is hanging on its own. So, here u corresponds to deflection a corresponds to tension in the cable q x which is the term on the right side of the equation it is the transverse load on the cable So, an example of transverse load could be the weight of the cable itself or if there is some um, thing sticking to it. So, that is the transfer or I can apply some external force also. Okay. So, that is the transverse load on the cable and in the boundary conditions we had this parameter q naught. Okay. So, q naught that is the axial force on the cable. So, it could be that I am pulling the cable at one end. So, that is the axial force, it is fixed at the other end. So, that q naught is axial force. Okay. So, this is one area in which I can use this differential equation, but it is applicable to several areas. The second area in which the same differential equation works is bar in tension. Okay. So, same differential equation if I know how to solve this uh, equation I can solve different types of problems. So, this is the bar in tension here u is my deflection okay. it is the axial force no I am not saying deflection q q 0. So, u is deflection a corresponds to a constant e which is Young's modulus times cross section area of the bar. Okay. Then this q corresponds to friction on the bar or some people can call it traction. So, what does it mean suppose I have a bar like this, let us say the bar is fixed here and I am applying some friction here. So, that is what q x means okay. and this big q, q naught is axial force. So, these two equations, these two cases are from the area of solid mechanics. Now, we will go to heat transfer. So, this is heat transfer, this is the third area. So, in case of uh, heat transfer, u corresponds to temperature, which is T. A corresponds to conductivity, thermal conductivity. Okay. Q x corresponds to heat generated.
and Q naught corresponds to heat. Okay. So, if we know how to solve one equation, we can solve different types of problems. That is the point what I am trying to make. Another example, it is this equation also works for one dimensional laminar incompressible flow. where in a channel where gradient of p is equal to constant. Okay. So, here u corresponds to velocity a corresponds to viscosity q x corresponds to pressure gradient and q naught corresponds to axial stress. This is also good for flow in porous media in one dimension, in one dimension. So, suppose you have sand and you are putting water at one side and how this water moves in this sand. The same equation will help you understand. So, in that case u corresponds to fluid head a corresponds to permeability constant permeability coefficient and then q corresponds to flux and q naught corresponds to flow. Okay. And the sixth case is electrostatics. So, here u corresponds to electrostatic potential, mu corresponds to your permeability co coefficient, no actually I am sorry this is dielectric constant. And then Q naught Q corresponds to charge density and q dot corresponds to electric flux. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, you will see that there are one single equation, if we know how to solve it which is this equation, then it can solve a large class of problems. Okay. Similarly, we will see that in two dimensional situations, this one particular equation can address a very large class of problems. So, this is there. So, now what we will do is, we will with this understanding develop its weighted, first we will develop a weighted integral statement and then we will develop its weak formulation and then we will explain what is happening in this thing. So, weak formulation. So, the first step and we have discussed some of this earlier also, but now we are going to expand on it is that we develop we compute the residue of the system multiply it by a weight function and equate it to 0. So, this is minus d over d x a of x times u prime minus q and then I multiply it by a weight function w and this is equal to 0. So, this 
entire thing is the error and actually it is weighted error weighted error in an weighted integral sense. So, here we are computing the error over the whole domain not point by point, because we are integrating this over the domain 0 to L and some other times we also call it in a weighted residual sense and they mean the same. Okay. So, the next thing we do is step 2 is that oh, so there should be a d x here. So, the next thing we do is we integrate this entire expression by parts, which we had done earlier we had shown that if I integrate this pi parts, I am able to shift the differentiability operator. So, I am I think I miss this also here differentiability operator from this term to uh, w. So, integrate by parts to shift d over d x operator from this term which is in parenthesis to w. So, if we do that and I have explained that in the earlier class what we get is integral of 0 to l and then here I get d w over d x this is a of x u prime minus w q d x minus and then I get a boundary term w times a of x times u prime 0 to l okay. and this entire thing equals 0. So, this entire expression is mathematically same as equation 1, but this is the weak form. this is the weak form, <coughs> because our requirement of differentiability on u is only a first order and I have shifted that differentiability on to w. So, that is one. So, we will make some important comments here. First is if we use this weak form differentiability requirements on u get reduced. Okay. The second and important condition to note is that we also get boundary terms. See this is a boundary term ok. So, if I look at the boundary terms, what I get is w a x 0 to l, this is the boundary term right, this is equal to w and I should have u prime here a x u prime at x is equal to l minus w a prime these are the boundary terms ok. Now, in this we have this term. So, these are two boundary terms one boundary term is associated with the first boundary x equals l other one is associated with x is equal to 0 and the one which I have put it in green the mathematical relation which is a x u prime is same as 
this boundary term a d u over d x. Okay. So, we, when we integrate by parts, so this is my natural boundary condition and what we see, see is that when we integrate this equation in pa by parts, I get boundary terms and one boundary term which is the natural boundary term comes out naturally or by itself in the, in the process. So, I do not have to worry of enforcing this boundary term when I make a choice of what kind of u should be chosen. Okay. If you remember earlier we said that we, we can choose u as a sum of c j phi j's, different c j's and phi j's right. And those things have to satisfy the boundary conditions, but because this boundary term comes out by itself. Though, so, in that case I do not have to necessarily worry about enforcing this boundary term by proper choice of c j and phi j, because it will get naturally implemented. So, the only thing now I have to worry about is that my essential boundary terms are enforced. Okay. So, I will explain that. So, in a step 3, we choose u. So, this is we have to now assume some for form of u. So, we choose u to be u j phi j of x j is equal to 1 to n. Okay. This is what we choose and we and how while we uh, we are making this choice so u j is unknown constant and phi j this is the shape function right this is a shape function and because we are making a choice if whether it is a cubic function or a square function or a linear function we have to make a huh? Huh. so it could be even sinusoidal it could be even sinusoidal there is no reason that it has to be, but polynomials are easy to integrate and differentiate so we so phi j is known shape function And in this case, if we are our domain is from 0 to L, then phi j should be such that it meets the, so it is known shape function and it has to be of a particular type that it should satisfy essential boundary conditions. It need not, it need not satisfy the natural boundary condition because the natural boundary condition through this mathematics is itself coming out and we can put the value when we solve this equation I can replace a x suppose a x u prime is equal to 3. Suppose the boundary condition is such that a x u prime at x is equal to equals 3 then I can replace this by that number 3. Okay. So, I do not have to worry my choice of phi j has to be such that it should meet essential boundary conditions. We do not have to worry that it also should meet natural boundary conditions because that compliance is automatically taken care of in the weak form, not in the strong form. So, by the way this is known as a strong form. So, in the weak form it is automatically taken care of. So, I have more flexibility in choosing the nature of phi j's or phi j's. So, that is there. So, one is that phi j is known, second is about, about uh, picking up phi j is that it has to satisfy essential boundary conditions and the third criteria which we have to enforce is that it has to be linearly independent. What does that mean? So, suppose I take phi j as x for instance. For instance, if I take phi j as x and for first shape function I pick it pick as phi 1 equals x, then the next shape function should not be a linear com, uh, combination of phi 1. So, it could be x square that is fine, but it cannot be 2 x because it is a linear multiple. Okay. So, it, the third shape function could not be x plus x square it has to be 
linearly independent function. So I have I can pick as many functions as I want, but they should be mutually linearly independent. So that is a very important criteria when we are making uh, this thing. So if we choose phi j as this, and then what I do is I plug this thing back into the definition of u. Okay. So then what I get is Okay. So, this is the equation I get and I am here summing up j is equal to 1 to n. Okay. So, phi j is known, c j is not known, there are n values of these unknowns and w is also right now not known, but it is some weighting function, right? it is some weight function and to know these n unknowns, I can pick n types of n different weighting functions and I will get n different equations. I can solve them and I can get the value of C j. Okay. So, that is the overall thinking underlying the weak formulation. So, what we will do is we will continue this discussion in the next class. Phi j dash. Okay. Yeah, there is a prime thing and so that is right. So, this is a differential of phi j. So, that concludes our discussion for today and we will extend this discussion also tomorrow. So, look forward to seeing you. Thanks. <laughs>